So I'm going to call for the next talk, which is uh, Rocket Studies of the Atmosphere. It's by Phil, Philip Eberspeaker. My name is Phil Eberspeaker. I'm the uh, head of the NASA Sounding Rockets program. So uh, I'm not a scientist or a physicist. So I'm not going to be presenting a lot of squiggly lines and chemical equations and colorful plots with loads of atmospheric physics in, in it. But I'm going to tell you about how we support these missions and, uh, and produce atmospheric studies using suborbital rocketry. A little bit of history and some of the most recent things we've been doing. And uh, <clears throat> so again, there's too many, far too many of these to talk about in, in 20 minutes. Uh, we fly hundreds of these rockets uh, over the course of my career. I've spent my entire career with sounding rockets since graduating with an aerospace engineering degree from NC State in 86. Uh, so I just picked a few samples uh, that kind of represent where the, uh, the program is heading and uh, doing these sorts of things. So, uh, so forgive me for not being a physicist. Uh, as you're all aware, I'm not going to talk about the structure of the atmosphere, but uh, you're all well aware of what the atmosphere looks like and what interesting things are going on. So we are uh, supporting operations primarily above 80 kilometers and 120 kilometers for a lot of the atmospheric type things we're talking about. However, we do actually go much higher to 1,400 kilometers, studying things like in the cusp of where particles are moving out away from the, uh, the Earth. And uh, so we cover a very broad spectrum of uh, science and regions uh, with our suborbital rockets. We maintain a family of vehicles to try to uh, pick the right rocket for the right job. We are a very uh, low-cost program. We're part of low-cost access to space. We scrounge things up like surplus rocket motors, where Scott scrounges up payloads and things. We are uh, the uh, MacGyvers of NASA by figuring out how to do things and accomplish science uh, with very uh, low-cost uh, systems. We do reach a wide variety of, of atmospheric uh, and altitude regions, uh, certainly down in the auroral-type zones at the 100 kilometer range, a lot of rockets go on uh, there. Uh, usually are launching multiple rockets in support of, a, of an operation. We also have a lot of scientists that love to look at the high altitude regions, 1,400, 1,500 kilometers high. So having our vehicles be able to support those uh, ranges are critical for our successful program. Uh, just so in case you're not familiar with a sounding rocket, uh, this is actually a, uh, a two-stage vehicle that we use with the University of Colorado with their uh, space grant to where we're actually launching student experiments uh, on a two-stage vehicle. A surplus rocket motor boosting the, uh, the vehicle. This is actually a Navy asset. And this is actually a Patriot missile for the second stage. We convert it into a, a sounding rocket. And uh, of course, not quite the space shuttle, not quite an Atlas, uh, but we launch a lot of these uh, on average about 20 per year around the world. So, now this was a great video here, unfortunately didn't make a transition between Mac and PC, but it shows a uh, slow speed liftoff of a uh, three-stage vehicle breaking through this box. Uh, a lot of our activities go on at Poker Flats, Alaska, uh, and in the past uh, up in Churchill and in Norway. When it's minus 50 degrees, we have to heat the boxes, heat the rocket motors, so they don't want to blow up on us. We actually have had a rocket motor freeze and blow up on us a number of years ago. So we don't like doing that sort of thing. So I can't show you that cool video. But uh, anyway, we do this worldwide. That's another very important aspect for sounding rockets. And uh, one of our hallmarks is we go to where the science is and when the science is. Yes, we're not a satellite that's orbiting continuously and getting continuous coverage, uh, but we can go there and wait for the uh, science to occur and launch into the science, obtaining in situ uh, uh, measurements that are needed by the science community. So all over the world uh, doing this. You can imagine us sending missiles around the world with the ITAR and all those sorts of things going on that we have to deal with. Uh, we actually had to leave a vehicle in Norway for this past year and had to convince the State Department and all that that we could leave this missile on a foreign country. And uh, so all kinds of fun supporting this sort of activity. And so these launch activities take us anywhere from the equator uh, towards maybe 100 degrees and 120 degree, uh, percent humidity to uh, minus 40, minus 50 in Alaska or Churchill or, or Norway. So we have to run the gambit of environments to have these vehicles and these systems work. And so they have to be very, very GI proof and very rugged. A little bit of quick history is uh, sounding rockets have been around for quite some time and uh, started uh, essentially with, with Dr. Goddard in his rocket attempts and uh, his means for reaching extreme altitudes. He never quite reached the extreme altitudes he was hoping for, but he did attempt to uh, 
put one of the first instruments on a rocket and uh, achieved a whopping 170 feet altitude to measure <laughs> atmospheric pressure. Uh, people were flying kites to 10,000 feet before he did this, so he wasn't quite breaking uh, ground on atmospheric research, but he was the start of, uh, of research on rockets. Uh, there were some Russians who were doing this, and a few years later, they'd actually fly to, I believe, about eight miles high and obtain some atmospheric data. But then after World War II, the capturing of the V-2 rockets were then applied to uh, atmospheric research. And this is where the science community, the physicists, were trying to just, just break ground on how to make these measurements with rockets. They had no idea how to do it, and so they're just lucky to get any kind of data when they're trying to do the research. And then over time, through the military, <coughs> they started employing uh, Arabi rockets and black corporals and all sorts of things, uh, obtaining scientific data on the rockets. <coughs> Uh, one of the earliest research tools was a cryogenic whole air sampler flown on an uh, Araby uh, 150 rocket. Interesting thing about that rocket was it was a liquid fueled uh, upper stage, a solid rocket booster, and they were both ignited at the same time. So you had the solid booster firing with the uh, liquid booster uh, upper stage firing up past it so you can sort of see the cone at the bottom uh, of the uh, vehicle here where it allowed that uh, exhaust to pass by. And very simple design, but uh, used quite extensively on a whole variety of, of early rockets. So that was some of the basic history. And it's been going on for a very long time. Once they started launching satellites, the perception was no longer we need sounding rockets. We'll do all this sort of thing with, uh, with, uh, with satellites. That was you know, 60 years ago. And sounding rockets are still a very important aspect in doing this sort of atmospheric research. So it's been a very persistent uh, capability uh, for the science community. So we're running into some more of the more recent uh, activities we've been doing and supporting for atmospheric research is my first mission was with actually Dr. Barth, my first project management in 1988. I was just out of college for a couple years and uh, managed his project. And of course he was doing his, uh, his measurements with the, the spectrum with nitrous oxide and doing the great things he did. Now unfortunately, and this is the most sophisticated diagrams I could find of his instrument. Now I've got all kinds of video and all kinds of great pictures and all sorts of things, but you kind of see the, the evolution of the, just trying to get some science on a V2 to actually getting some reasonable uh, instruments uh, flown on rockets. And then now we're doing all sorts of things we'll to get to. And unfortunately, we didn't get second stage ignition on this mission. And luckily the payload parachuted down uh, with a fail-safe system and uh, we got it back. Dr. Barth was very understanding. He understood rockets and rocketry and things always don't go right. And uh, so he kind of took it all in stride. We ended up coming back that next spring up in Alaska and actually launched within seven days. We went up there seven days from the time we got there, we launched and he was very successful with his mission. Uh, very interesting point here is when I came back to Wallops for the Spanish Inquisition after that failure, my uh, boss has kind of said, Phil, if you blank up a few more times, you'll be in management. <laughs> and uh, 20 years later, I apparently have blanked up enough. Now I run the program. So uh, it's like a very long history associated with sort of activity. Not to some cloud research, uh, of course, is very important in utilizing sounding rockets. You know, the meteoric dust particles causing high altitude uh, ice particles, those sorts of things. Lots of missions in the past supporting Knox Luce and Clouds, Dr. Goldberg, with the drops payload. Was, uh, <clears throat> it made lots of measurements uh, with uh, single stage black brand rocket vehicles, uh, Dr. Goldberg and others. I'm not sure I'm capturing, I'm not capturing all the uh, individuals <laughs> who are participating in the activities, but doing a lot of research on gravity waves. And uh, particularly here, this was actually a large campaign. It involved LIDARs, balloons, MET rockets, and sounding rockets being launched from uh, Andoya rocket range in Norway and S range. There's a mountain range separating them and looking at those dynamics, the atmosphere, the gravity waves and things are being produced uh, with a very extensive campaign. So our, our, our operations can include multiple rockets from multiple locations to accomplish the science that's necessary. You're all familiar with the uh, very uh, interesting physics in the atmosphere, all the dynamics and things going on. And one important aspect we do for sounding rockets is chemical tracer uh, missions, where at least chemicals like trimethyl aluminum to, uh, to be able to observe the uh, particle motion at 120 kilometers or so, plus or minus, and generating their uh, plots on particle velocities and things. Tomex is one example, the turbulent oxygen mixing experiment uh, with Dr. Hector Clemens from Aerospace Corporation. This was launched at White Sands Missile Range to get an idea 
of the scale and the size of a, of a payload for sounding rocket application. That was done a number of years ago. Uh, here's uh, TMA, trimethyl aluminum releases. This was tro uh, tro turbo pause to where we actually had uh, four rockets launched over a period of, tw of two hours to look at the particle dynamics, uh, sort of in a temporal uh, perspective uh, over a, a few hours. <clears throat> But with these scientists, you always got to get more complicated. Start off with a very simple instrument, then start adding instruments, and now I need multiple rockets. And oh, by the way, I need those multiple rockets to intersect the magnetic field lines at the same time. <laughs> so we had to develop two large payloads, launch on two large four-stage vehicles, launching from Norway. We're trying to get the timing right so that the part payloads are flying through the same magnetic field lines at the same time, so now I can measure the dynamics and the particles and the motions and the physics going on uh, at various altitudes along the same magnetic field lines. That was very successful, pulled that off, and uh, got good results out of that mission. <clears throat> uh, here, example, is some of the boom systems. Uh, hopefully we'll run here. Uh, we have to do that we not only support with the rockets and the missions, but we develop the payload systems to support these. Uh, here you see some booms deploying. And of course, you always need to get your sensors really far apart so you can make these measurements of the electric fields. And so these booms have to come out uh, quite extensively. Uh, here's one example of that. Some smaller particle detectors. We have to come up with ways to uh, deploy those and get them out. So this is uh, some ESA booms. Uh, very short things coming out. As they're popping. So while we're doing all this sort of testing in an attempt to try to make sure these things are going to work in the space environment, Always challenging in the 1G and 1 atmosphere uh, environment of the laboratory. And then culminating with the launches in Norway. So you see the styrofoam boxes built around the vehicles to try to keep them warm and toasty. You notice uh, we use surplus rocket motors that might be 30 years old. And a lot of times propellant comes raining out of these things. And so we have a tendency to start a lot of fires. And, uh, <laughs> And actually, we have a launch pad at Wallops near the Antares launch pad. We warned them that we launched these rocket motors from the, near the Antares pad. Don't worry about it, they said. But then when they saw all these particles falling down on their fuel farm next to us, they decided to spend a couple million dollars and move our launcher. But, uh, <clears throat> so we warned them. Uh, they didn't want to listen. <laughs> then came along another group, uh, Dr. Larson from Clemson and others, who wanted to uh, get a large spatial separation between releases of trimethyl aluminum. So he involved five rockets being launched in a, uh, I believe a five minute time frame to then release the chemical tracers at various points along the trajectories. And here you see three of the rockets on the pad, here you see a time lapse of the uh, liftoff, and then you can actually see the traces all the way out to 550 kilometers from Wallops to make their measurements. Also a very challenging mission because once you push the button on the first one, you've got to be somewhat guaranteed you can push the button on the last one uh, five minutes later when you've got boats and weather and things uh, that you have to deal with out there. So very challenging. EVEX was launching Quadrant and Toll, an equatorial type mission. A lot of times at northern latitudes or equatorial latitudes. Uh, very interesting chemical releases of uh, uh, trimethyl aluminum and strontium and various other uh, chemicals, looking at the ionization and the various positive ions and things to see how motions of uh, particles occur. And this interesting aspect is, is the science team sends observation sites to local islands, remote islands, who have relatively primitive uh, groups of people living there. And so you have to go there and explain to them, you're going to see these lights in the sky. <laughs> you know, please don't chop the heads off of our scientists here. Uh, thinking that they're responsible. They are responsible, but it's, not, it's okay. Uh, and you know, that's a fact that we have to actually continue is try to, to, to talk to these folks locally to make sure that, uh, that we don't do something we don't really want to do with these kind of missions. So always very interesting aspects. Then uh, Dr. Condi uh, from the University of uh, Alaska comes along and doesn't want to leave a trail of trimethyl aluminum. He wants to explode small ampules all over the sky. And uh, he wanted to actually try to detonate 24 of these things using model rocket motors to rocket propel these little sub payloads from the main payload. Very easy for a physicist to say, I want to use a model rocket motor to, f to fire these little ampules. You have to call the engineers in to figure out how to actually make those little model rocket motors work with a, with a very cheaply. And we were somewhat successful. The payload here at the bottom had like 48 doors that had to open. 
and uh, we had, had about 150 pyrotechnic events to get this done. And uh, we were marginally successful. Not too bad for the first one, for the first actual science mission. But, oops. Let's see if I can get this to run here. There's the aurora. There you see the detonations going on, and then hopefully, if you can see the uh, various chemical tracers they're going through their dynamics and moving up to the atmosphere and doing their things. That's a sped up time lapsed uh, photography of that. So luckily the ones that did detonate, detonated at the proper altitudes. We had to detonate these at this precise altitudes on the way down. So we injected them with rocket motors, they went through their trajectories, and on the way down they would explode four at a time. We actually had to modify our uh, add to control system to determine where the rocket was in real time calculate the trajectory for each of these ampules, determine a detonation time, pass the detonation time to those ampules, then eject them with rocket motors, so hopefully they would detonate at the right time on the way down. Very complex uh, system to be able to do that, so <clears throat> ultimately we did achieve the comprehensive success. This is a Norway mission. We tried to launch last November. The science and weather did not cooperate. That's, this is the rocket, this is the missile we've left in Norway at a NATO base in a, locked up in a bunker. And uh, this individual mission wanted to go to the cusp, so flying to 1,200 kilometers or so to achieve, to achieve the science. Uh, another scientist wanted these spinning sub payloads. They were spinning perpendicular to the spin axis of the rocket. He wanted them to eject at 100 miles per hour. He had six of them. So he actually had to develop an air spring system to eject these. And uh, it actually was a very complex mission for us to try to accomplish. And here was an early test of the ejection system in high speed. It's not spinning at the moment. But it wasn't so hard to accelerate this one meter long piston to 100 miles an hour. The trick was to stop it from 100 miles an hour in about three inches of space. <laughs> so I tended to tear itself apart. Uh, far we did manage to uh, get the engineering straight and get that uh, working. So that was a very good challenge for us. Um, again, some more boom tests. Some of them aren't quite pretty. Uh, here's one, again, you're operating in 1G, and they come down, flop down, and do all kinds of bizarre things, and it's just amazing you don't tear them apart uh, trying to verify they're gonna work in space. But, uh, so, you see we have a little bit of a problem here. Uh, so we have broken elbow, but we'll uh, we fix that and moved on. Uh, here's launch activities. Um, everybody likes to see rocket launch before I run out of too much time here. Eight, seven, six, five, four. This is from up on CM Hill at Poker Flats. One, zero. You can tell what kind of rocket this is using a tailless booster because of all the stuff falling out of it. <laughs> but, uh, we had a DOD guy a number of years ago look at that and says, oh my gosh, that's a failure. He says, no, that happens all the time. <laughs> but, uh, he says, oh, okay. And shook his head. Now, finally here is this is a uh, launch up at Poker. It was a series of four rockets. We launched the first two rockets about a minute apart, and 30 minutes later launched a, uh, a second pair. And you see time-lapse uh, images of the launches and the releases. But to close here, there is a melding of art and science in the last couple minutes I have. Uh, this is actually a lot of uh, photographers go up there and like to uh, photograph the Aurora and our rocket launches. And so they provide us, allow us to uh, show us some presentations. But that's the incredible thing about doing this atmospheric research, especially in northern latitudes, is the aurora borealis and seeing this incredible display that nature has to offer. And uh, so we wait for the right conditions. And then... Uh, let's see if I can jump ahead just a little in the interest of time. See if you can watch this forever, but All right, here we go. This is something from Fury Summit, which is about uh, maybe eight to ten miles away from the launch pad. We're launching a series of rockets, uh, one after the other. So again, you're very nervous, but once you push that first button, your whole sequence of four launches have to occur uh, in sequence at the right time. 
We have to make sure the rocket flies where we want it to fly that first time, so we make sure we don't have a safety issue, do some real-time calculations, and then make a quick real-time decision in a matter of uh, 30 or 40 seconds, and can we proceed on and launch the next rocket. So always an operational challenge for our folks. We're sort of world's experts at doing this sort of thing. Is that yours or mine? <clears throat> and then, eventually, you get to the point where you're releasing the chemical tracer. In the sky. Again, you have two rockets flying at the same time right now. One's, e one's ejecting the uh, trimethyl aluminum on the up leg. The other one's waiting to release its chemicals on the way down so you get the appropriate uh, spatial relationship. And again, the payload is in free flight, external atmospherically, essentially. And so this is the particle dynamics, the winds uh, making this uh, chemical do what it's doing. They have ground sites at various locations in Alaska triangulating on these clouds and they can track the motions and that's what gives you the, uh, the wind and the vertical and, and horizontal profile. And almost there. So you see how it's dispersing. And now in the down leg you'll see actually a pulsing uh, release. You can pulse it where it is around the images. Here, about midway down the screen. You can see a very interesting uh, dynamic going on here. Once it gets down deeper into the atmosphere, you see this neat little display of, of, of light that's being generated by these particles. And I don't understand the physics. We just try to make sure we spit this stuff out at the right time. And uh, we'll be coming up here and then we'll be done. Here we go. So now you see this, I don't know what's going on here, but, uh, but you see this interesting, this interesting uh, light show occurring. Okay, it's time for me to wrap up. Are there any questions? We've been doing this for a very long time, continuing on with Dr. Barth's uh, work he's been doing for a very, very long time as well. Thank you. Questions or comments, Dan Baker. So you uh, alluded to the uh, satellite versus rockets. Now more, more and more people are getting on the CubeSat mm -hmm. bandwagon. Of course, small and expensive satellites. How do you see the relationship evolving between the uh, rocket world and the CubeSat world? Yeah, there's lots of debate on on the. But yeah, the, the uh, question was, uh, how does CubeSat fall into the realm uh, relative to sounding rockets and to satellites? Uh, one thing it does is it's potentially going to compete for sounding rocket science money. Uh, NASA's still trying to work that out. Uh, there's still lots of value in the suborbital rockets, uh, but there is some value being seen, especially in the, uh, the geospace uh, science realm of the uh, CubeSat. We view the CubeSat as a class sub D type payload that's very akin to a sounding rocket. And so we think that we can pull in our class sub D 7120.8 NASA lingo uh, management. Uh, to actually support CubeSat work. Uh, so Waltz has actually has a CubeSat, beginnings of a CubeSat office uh, we've offered to support activities, things. So it's, a, it's almost a logical extension of a sounding rocket to a CubeSat and ultimately to a satellite. So we see it as a, as a continuum. And so we'll work along with it. Yes. yes curious. Yeah, was Tom Woods rocket going off today or was that? The 21st. 21st. 21st, okay. Yeah. So hopefully that one will go good too. So. We got one going. Yep. Very good. Davis. Yep. So, so since we're talking about Dr. Barr, certainly when he came to LASP, he became an active participant in the LASP sounding rocket program. Did he do sounding rocket research before he came to LASP? And yeah. Was that an uh, active part of his interest in coming to LASP? Yeah. Okay. The answer was yes. He did do uh, rocket and experiments and that was part of his interest in coming to be director of last week. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. Well, thank you.